everyone. Um, we're going to give people another minute or two to jump into the room uh, before we get started. But thank you all for attending. Uh, we got some. Uh, we got a good number of people who have RSVP'd and a good number of people um, pouring into the room. All right, looks like our participant number has sort of leveled off. So um, I'm happy to get started. Once again, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to uh, virtually see you. My name is John Hudak. I'm the director of the Office of Cannabis Policy, and I'll be the moderator for today's cannabis conversation um, on medical testing and contaminants in the medical program. On behalf of OCP, we thank you for being here. This is our second uh, such event um, in our cannabis conversation panel series. Um, we're excited to be continuing the series in the future. Um, and so stay tuned to our social media and to our website to see future events uh, that are listed. Um, I've got a little bit of information I'm going to start out with um, for a, a brief presentation, uh, and then we'll meet our panelists. Uh, first, we're going to take a look. Um, it's important to talk about testing generally uh, in the state of Maine, and it's important to talk first about uh, adult use testing and contaminants. Um, adult use cannabis uh, and cannabis products in Maine uh, go through mandatory product testing. Um, they are tested for a variety of harmful contaminants. Uh, we list them here uh, on the uh, on the left hand side of the slide. Uh, we test for mold and mildew, microbes, uh, filth and foreign material, water activity, heavy metals, etc. On the right hand side, it shows what uh, the analytes, what those items we test for, most commonly fail for. Uh, so yeast and mold, um, heavy metals, uh, particularly arsenic, there's a lot of arsenic in water in Maine, um, pesticides, and obviously THC potency per pack or per serving. Um, those are the common ones uh, that fail, but in the adult use market, um, because we have uh, mandatory testing and we have a track and trace system, we're able to stop those products from getting to, into consumers' hands. We're able to put administrative holds on products um, that stop them uh, in the production or in the sales process. Um, and we're also able to order remediation or order destruction for contaminated products that don't meet uh, the standards. <clears throat> All right. Uh, contrary, though, to the uh, adult use program, the medical program, uh, the medical cannabis program in Maine is not subject uh, to mandatory testing. Uh, we've gotten a lot of complaints at the office uh, from people in industry, from patients, um, from advocacy organizations about this lack of mandatory testing uh, and real concerns about contaminants in. Uh, the supply chain and the medical cannabis supply chain. And so um, what uh, I wanted to do was get some data that we could put to this question about what actually is in Maine's medical cannabis. Uh, and so over the past several weeks, um, OCP uh, began uh, taking samples from stores that were uh, going through inspections, medical cannabis uh, stores that were going through inspections. Um, we sampled, uh, we took 127 uh, medical cannabis samples um, 57 of those samples failed for at least one analyte. Um, several of them failed for multiple anal analytes um, for an overall fail rate of 45%. Um, I've had conversations with other medical cannabis uh, business owners um, who also test not only their own uh, uh, product, but any product that is going to be put on their shelves. Um, uh, some, some of them have noted uh, their fail rates that they've seen uh, for other companies quite a bit higher uh, than 45%. Um, but about half of all of the samples that we took uh, are uh, came back in a way that would not uh, pass muster in the adult use program and frankly wouldn't pass muster um, in a lot of states that have uh, mandatory testing uh, for their medical products. Uh, here we list uh, the three categories of analytes that most commonly failed. Yeast and mold was, was a big one. Um, pesticides, including Eagle 20, um, and harmful microbes uh, as well. One of the real challenges, however, in the medical program for us is the way that the main medical cannabis statute is structured. Uh, the medical cannabis statute is structured in a way uh, that protect, protects producers um, at the expense of patients. Um, so we have these data uh, from sampling uh, medical cannabis over the past several weeks. Um, the Office of Cannabis Policy is not allowed under statute um, to tell patients uh, what stores have failed, what they have failed for, we can't implement administrative holds or order destruction of products. What we did instead was we asked businesses 
um, to destroy tainted products. Uh, some businesses were um, willing to do that. Um, others we did not hear back from, uh, but we lack the tools to um, uh, warn the public that there, it, that there are contaminants uh, in the uh, supply, except for these top line numbers uh, that we can produce. Um, so I'm gonna wrap my part of the presentation there. Um, and uh, I'm excited to introduce uh, two guests um, we have today um, who are experts in their own right um, about medical cannabis. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about where cannabis contaminants come from, uh, what the health impacts are if they're consumed, uh, and why it's important to test for them in a regulated market. I'll start first by introducing Steph Shearer. Um, Steph is the founder and president of Americans for Safe Access. Um, ASA is the largest national member-based organization of patients, medical professionals, scientists, and concerned citizens promoting safe and legal access to cannabis for therapeutic use and research. Steph's direct experience with the medical benefits of cannabis and political organizing background led to the formation of ASA in 2002 with the purpose of building a strong grassroots movement to protect patients uh, and their rights. I've known Steph for the better part of a decade now. Um, she's one of the um, best, most vocal, uh, most well-informed uh, medical cannabis patient advocate in the world. Uh, and we're really thrilled uh, that you were able to join us, Steph. Uh, Steph has a brief presentation to start us off um, and pre provide some context, and then we'll meet our second panelist. So I'll turn it over to you, Steph. Thank you, John. Um, and thanks everyone for uh, for joining us today. Um, you know, as uh, John mentioned, you know, I've been working on medical cannabis issues in the United States for over 21 years, um, and we definitely have seen um, a lot of progress. And I think one of the biggest things that it, we're seeing some growing pains is that we're moving cannabis out of the illicit market into a regulated market. And in the United States, where you know anything that is produced for human consumption uh, is subject to regulations. And so I think you know what what I've seen some polling um, of patients in Maine is that most people think that their products are being tested. Um, and I think that that is sort of a natural um, feeling. So you know I want to start by saying I, you know cannabis is an amazing plant. Um, and you know this is not about whether cannabis has medical benefits or not. Um, but we need to remember it is a plant. And so all plants are subject to contaminants. And you know, cannabis um, in its natural form is inherently safe, um, but it's susceptible to contaminants during cultivation, manufacturing, um, the handling, um, and even storing. Um, and so whether you are purchasing cannabis from a regulated um, uh, uh, market, uh, even in the adult use, um, or cultivating it yourself, you know, these contaminants can come in at, at any time. Um, if we see the next slide, I'll kind of walk you through where these happen. Um, so I also do the like contaminants are, you know, they don't equal some malice or like uh, ill intent, right? Like, you know, because cannabis is a plant, it is just, you know, it is susceptible to these contaminants. And it is because it is a high value crop, um, you know, there may be, you know, more of a tendency towards adulteration. Um, but again, when you say contaminants, it doesn't mean that there's someone who is, uh, you have some evil plan to contaminate patients. So, you know, during the cultivation processing, you know, uh, pesticides uh, can, you know, if they're not properly used, can remain on the plants. Um, because of its um, high uh, water content, um, and also because of the resin on the flowers, it's really easy for cannabis to pick up you know, other bacteria in the air. Um, and cannabis is a bioaccumulator, which means that it will pull any heavy metal out of the soil. So, you know, you may not know, um, you know, what was cultivated in your, you know, where you're cultivating cannabis, you know, decades before, um, but cannabis can pull any of that out of the ground and it ends up in, in the flowers. Um, during manufacturing, this is where we see, you know, sometimes there's adulterants or additives added things that haven't been tested for um, you know, human consumption. So like, often people may add terpenes, uh, foreign terpenes back into a uh, tincture to give it that cannabis smell. Um, but those products have not been tested for inhalation. Um, and I think you know, we saw the vape scare um, a, you know, a few years ago where people were dying because of 
uh, vitamin E and and you know products that were not meant to be inhaled put into vaporizers. Um, and then also during the process of manufacturing, uh, when they are actually creating um, you know creating these tinctures or oils or or uh, concentrates, uh, you know if they're not careful, if it's not done correctly, um, the solvents can stay in the final product, and these are very dangerous uh, for human consumption. And then storage, that this is this could happen in a store, but this also includes like once you bring it home, right? If you're not careful with where you keep your cannabis, you could be introducing molds, mildews, and fungus um, and other bacteria. Um, and you know, if you have a vape cartridge, um, you have to, you know, those are not meant for to, to be used forever. They actually, if they're you know old, heavy metals can actually seep into those products. Um, so you know, again, contaminants happen all along the supply chain, and everyone has to be involved in in testing and making sure that those are there. In Maine, um, consumers have this great option that they can actually take their products into a lab and get them tested. So if you're cultivating uh, for yourself or someone else, you can bring um, you can bring these into labs and see um, see what's in those products. Next slide. So you know, um, again, this isn't to scare people, but I want people to understand that when we're talking about these contaminants, these have you know real implications um, you know to patients' health. Um, and I believe that you know a larger presentation is going to be made available to everyone. So I don't want to. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, but I will say for all of these health impacts of these contaminants, um, these symptoms are more severe in children, the elderly, and individuals with compromised immune systems. So I don't really understand any argument why you wouldn't want to test medicine for a patient. Um, there is no there is no argument. And again, um, you know, there isn't someone with like a little bag of mold and mildew trying to hurt patients. It is just the natural process of dealing with an agricultural product. Um, next slide. Um, so residual solvents, I meant this is ethanol, propane, butane. Um, you know, if these products are inhaled, these have, you know, very severe and long lasting um, impacts. And I would also say, you know, one of the other things that really concerns um, us at Americans for Safe Access as patient advocates is that these uh, symptoms, you know, are not immediate. So, uh, you know, some of the things like dizziness, rapid heartbeat, um, or a headache, you might feel right away, but you also may not associate it with your cannabis use. Um, next slide. And you know, same thing for like heavy metals. These are things that build up in your system. Um, and you know, again, you may not, um, you know, you may not feel them immediately. It's not like you have a you know a contaminant of heavy metal and you turn purple, um, and you know to stop using them. So that's why you know we need to like all other. Um, products for human consumption in the U.S., it's important that these products are subject to testing. And then next, next slide. Um, and yeast, uh, molds, uh, you know, John pointed out these were in, in lots of the samples. You, you might confuse these symptoms with, um, you know, with allergies or, you know, other, other items. So, you know, if you're, if you're feeling these um, uh, side effects, you, you should stop using cannabis, the cannabis immediately and you know you can actually take it to a lab and see if that was what was causing the problems. Next slide. Um, so for you, the one thing that you can definitely do as a patient to be safe, and this is where patients have you know the power of the dollar, um, and this is outside of any regulatory system, is that you can actually ask um, you know the the retailer or if you're buying from a, um, an individual um, caregiver. Uh, for the certificate of analysis. And there's actually a guide on our website of how to, to read that. Um, but there should be a batch number on the product that matches um, the certificate of analysis. And this way, you know um, that that product was tested. Um, and of course, you know, it would be great for patients to not have to worry about this, but this is, this is the reality. You have to advocate for yourself uh, in these markets. Next slide. That might be it. Excellent. Well, thank you, Steph, uh, for that presentation. Um, I want to remind everyone we will um, take a Q&A uh, toward the end of today's uh, presentation, uh, the last 15 minutes or so. So um, please uh, drop your uh, questions either into the chat box function or in the Q&A function that would be at the bottom 
uh, center of your screen. Um, our next guest today um, is Dr. Patty Locuritolo Hymanson, uh, a graduate of Yale University and New York Medical College. Dr. Hymanson has practiced neurology for over 25 years and has taught at Harvard Medical School and Boston City Hospital. Dr. Hymanson also served as a Maine State Representative from 2014 to 2022. She's the past chair of the Joint Committee on Health and Human Services, which had jurisdiction over medical cannabis until 2021. Dr. Hymanson, welcome. Uh, could you tell us a little bit to kick things off um, about your background and go into some more detail about what contaminated cannabis can mean for a patient or a consumer's health? Yes, it's really a pleasure to be on this panel discussing such an important topic, and thank you for inviting me. I have no financial or any other attachment to this topic, except I'm concerned. Um, for, for, several year, for several decades, I've um, diagnosed and treated people on the seacoast with neurologic symptoms and disorders. I've been a physician to thousands of people in the hospital and in my office, following many for years as they dealt with their neurologic conditions, <clears throat> such as Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, migraine, stroke, dementia, epilepsy, pain syndromes, and others. <clears throat> As an elected Maine state representative here in parts of York, Wells, Sanford, and all of Ogunquit, living in York for 39 years, raising three kids with my husband, I was honored to be chair of the Joint Committee on Health and Human Services. So for six of my eight years in the legislature, we heard all the bills, had all the public hearings, uh, about medical cannabis. This was the time when I argued successfully for people being able to use cannabis for any symptom management they and their medical provider thought it might help. We took away all the nonsensical medical qualifications. People need to treat medical symptoms. People who need to treat medical symptoms expect the substances they call medicines to work and to be safe enough. They don't expect there to be pesticides, heavy metals like arsenic, fungus, butane, and other contaminants in the medicine they buy, then smoke or rub on their skin. Maine has a high level of bedrock with, in the ground with arsenic in it. Cannabis is really good as it grows at taking up the arsenic in the water and the soil. Smoking the cannabis delivers the arsenic to the body. Arsenic causes cancers, blood vessel disease, high blood pressure, diabetes type two, impaired concentration, learning, memory, reduced intelligence, especially in young people. It's easy to find out about the harm arsenic can do with a web search. Smoking or otherwise ingesting pesticides cannot be good for the body as a medicine expected is expected to be by someone who is suffering. Smoking some pesticides are likely less toxic than others, but understanding that takes time. Cancer, hormone disruption, confusion, numbness are long-term problems from a variety of pesticides that the person using medical cannabis for a problem might not consider came from the contaminants. When tinctures are made, propane, ethanol, and butane can be left behind. Short-term dizziness, rapid heartbeat, headache from these substances can be disabling, especially in people with illnesses who don't feel well to begin with. Smoking a fungus can lead to fungal sinus and lung infections, especially in people with poor immune systems, like in cancer or organ transplantation. In the end, at this point in time, no one is sure if and when these contaminants will harm people, especially sick people and people with medical symptoms on other medications. In my extensive clinical experience, people want to take medicine free from harmful substances in doses they can count on with reliable and expected results with expected side effects. In short, we have proof of contaminants in Maine. They can cause health problems. Taking them into your body when using cannabis as a medication could make you sicker. Know what you are buying, ask questions, get real answers or buy from someone else. 
demand your legislature, legislators, representatives, and senators have to pass laws to require mandatory testing. So I'm looking forward to hearing the questions that are asked and jumping in on some of the, the answers. Um, thank you all for being he here and inviting me. Well, thank you, Dr. Hymanson, for that. Um, I want to um, note uh, from what you had said, Dr. Hymanson, we do have evidence of uh, contaminants in our medical cannabis supply chain. I had noted earlier in my presentation that uh, the Office of Cannabis Policy did collect samples um, from medical retail stores um, uh, across the state over a, a few week period. And um, I presented some of the top line numbers uh, of that, res uh, that research so far, but in the coming weeks, uh, the Office of Cannabis Policy will publish a full report um, on that issue, on the contaminants on the supply chain, uh, with some ideas about what you can do to protect yourself, um, and as much as possible uh, within the statutory confidentiality protections uh, that exist uh, to be able to get as much information out as possible. Um, Steph, I wanna turn back to you, but, but really it's a question for both you and Dr. Hymanson. Um, and it was an important part of your presentation, but I'd love for you to expand on it uh, some more. Uh, what can patients in Maine do to ensure their medical cannabis meets their safety um, standards and their needs? I think the first thing is to educate themselves. And I think that, you know, um, I really appreciate this, um, this format. Uh, and I think, you know, letting other patients know that, you know, the supply chain from um, the medical supply chain is not tested. So first, just, you know, buying at their own risk, but they can specifically ask questions. Uh, I love what Dr. Hyman said, you know, ask questions. You have a right to ask, ask questions. You are, it's your money. Um, you know, you ask questions before you buy a car. Um, you should ask questions before you, you, you buy a medicine. Um, you can talk to your legislators about, um, about these laws. And then you can also test your, test the products yourself. Go, go to a lab. Um, we have a lot of resources at Americans for Safe Access on, you know, um, legislative language. Uh, we've created, we've issued a report uh, this summer called uh, Regulating Patient Health uh, that has, you know, sort of a deep dive into um, all of the, the testing that's happening around the country and into the side effects. Uh, but I'd say that, you know, the number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself. And I, you know, at Americans for Safe Access, we're working towards the day that patients only have to think about their medicine in the context of their healthcare journey, um, but we're not there yet, right? We're right now. We're still. We're, we're. These laws and regulations are still evolving, and so you know, you know, protect yourself, be safe, um, and like Dr. Evans said, ask a lot of questions. Dr. I would, add, I, I would add that it's important to ask specific questions. Yeah. <clears throat> I think if you just ask, "Is your um, is this tested?" You might get a Yes, because there may be some testing that goes on, but you have to ask, do you test for pesticides? Do you test for um, heavy metals? Do you test for molds? Um, and see what answers you get. Yeah, I would say there's no one, no one pays to get their cannabis test, tested um, and, and doesn't receive a certificate of analysis. So, you know, if they say yes, then ask for the certificate of analysis. Um, and again, you know, um, make sure that you're, you know, you're, you can see the batch number, you know, what was actually being tested. Um, because you can't just test once a year and say, this is what we found. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, because the, if the answer is yes, then, uh, then the, the next question is, have you tested this product that I'm going to buy from you? And so let's flip the script a little bit on that, um, as well. Um, you, you both offered some really great, uh, ideas on what patients can do. What can operators um, in the medical cannabis program do to ensure that their cannabis and cannabis products uh, do not become contaminated? I would say they can, one, they can, um, you know, be leaders. Um, you know, the way that regulations work in this country is they are um, a floor, not a ceiling. Um, so, you know, be better than what is in the legislation. Um, you know, demand that all of the products that you put on your shelves or that you supply to patients are tested. Uh, and, you know, you know, make sure that you have product safety protocols um, that are part of the intake, storage, um, and, and handling. And we have a, a great program in Americans for Safe Access called Patient Focused Certification um, that includes, you know, training and guidelines and checklists 
uh, that are basically, you know, GMP standards for cannabis. Uh, they're internationally recognized and use these resources. You know, again, um, you know, if you tell patients like these are tested and you raise the bar, consumers will follow. Yeah, I would also say because uh, Maine has a high level of arsenic in its um, bedrock, um, and I've gone through many public hearings about well water and testing for um, arsenic, um, and there are pockets, there's a, there's a nice map if you go on the um, CDC website of, of where arsenic is, concentrations are high, and you'd be surprised, and people should know that. So I think people who grow should also know that what their water supply is, what their ground, uh, what their soil arsenic contains, because as we've mentioned, the fancy word is a phytoremediator, which means a plant that remediates the soil. So it's been used, uh, hemp has been used um, in Chernobyl to clean up the um, radioactivity in the soil um, because it's so good at drawing these things into its, its plant. Um, so I think the, the arsenic is particular to Maine and uh, growers should uh, know that. So building on that a little bit, oh, go on, Steph. I was just gonna say, um, and nobody um, tried to sell the cannabis flowers um, from Chernobyl. <laughs> um, to, to build on uh, your point, uh, Dr. Hymanson, about uh, the presence of arsenic in Maine, um, that's obviously a contaminant that, that is concerning to you, I think, as a physician in general terms, obviously arsenic is um, uh, of concern, but especially given uh, your remarks about the bedrock in Maine. But uh, for, for both, uh, both panelists, what are some other contaminants that particularly concern you as a patient advocate, as a physician, et cetera? I will say that um, aspergillus concerns me. Oh, I think you froze a bit, Dr. Hymanson. Excuse me? Oh, you froze for a second. So aspergillus, oh. you said? Yeah, aspergillus. It's a, a mold and it's all over the place and there are many different forms of it. Some are very toxic, some are not. Um, but it, um, it, in people who are immunocompromised. Oh. Oh, another, another interruption there, Dr. Hemmingson. Steph, well, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I'll just, yeah. Um, uh, definitely, you know, all of the molds and mildews, I think that people, you know, for some reason that doesn't sound like a scary word, molds and mildews, but they, um, you know, they really can compromise your health and they have, you know, again, it's not necessarily something that you would associate with your cannabis use. So when you're going to see a medical professional and you're trying to identify like why you're, you know, having these allergy-like symptoms, um, but, you know, I, I hear often as a patient advocate, um, you know, uh, patients getting upset with, with barriers like, um, you know, we've had to fight to get patients allowed on organ transplant lists who use cannabis. And part of that, um, you know, the reason that um, that medical cannabis, that they test for cannabis is actually because of the contaminants in cannabis. It's not actually because of the medicine itself. It's actually because of, um, you know, these uh, contaminants that can actually, um, you know, interfere with the, with the transfer of a new organ. Yeah, and Steph, also one of the challenges, and you and I have talked about this before um, off camera, but uh, another challenge that exists at times in identifying whether contaminants are causing problems is that not every patient feels comfortable sharing with their physician uh, or their healthcare professional that they are even using medical cannabis. And so if someone comes in and presents with certain symptoms, um, the physician might be able to identify that as a potential contamination um, but if they are unaware of the patient using cannabis, that creates a, a difficulty in that diagnosis as well. Absolutely. And I think, you know, those, those fears are real. And I think as we are, um, you know, as things are progressing, I think that's, you know, those fears, um, you know, we're starting to see the federal government start to recognize um, that there's at least an accept accepted medical use. Um, so hopefully patients feel more comfortable talking to their patients um, about, or, or uh, patients feel more comfortable talking to their medical professionals about their use. Um, but again, if you are using cannabis as a medicine um, and you have other, you know, other health issues, uh, you know, and you're not talking to your medical professional, then you have to step up and do, and be that person for yourself. Um, you know, you have to be making sure that 
you're aware of these symptoms. And again, I'm, I don't want, I'm not trying to scare people. I just think that if, you know, if in this sort of area that we're in, that's partly regulated, um, that patients just need to be aware of what those symptoms are so they can make, make choices when they arise. Um, I think especially, one, Dr. especially vulnerable are people who are immunocompromised. That means if you're on steroids for something or you have an autoimmune disorder or cancer, you're on chemotherapy. And, you know, so much of the benefit from cannabis comes from the uh, suppression of nausea and um, increasing appetite. So it's an important um, symptom to control. But those are the very people who are so um, vulnerable to contaminants. They have to be particularly careful. I didn't want to jump into um, audience questions uh, just yet, but one question did come in from Norman Langley um, that really fits into exactly what we're talking about um, at this moment. And, and I'd love uh, both of your reactions. Um, the question is, what can you do if a, pro a cannabis product does make you sick or you believe it has made you sick? What, what steps should you take as a patient? The first thing is stop using it. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I, I don't know what the laws are in Maine. Um, you know, John had mentioned that they had found contaminants, but because of the regulations couldn't, uh, you know, let patients know. Um, but you should let, definitely let the, the source know um, like where, where you got that cannabis. Um, and, you know, in a um, in, in another world, you would you could also, um, you know, let the public know that this is a problem. But I think um, uh, John, is there a way that that patients can alert um, uh, your office about contaminated products? Yeah, absolutely. There's an, an open line to our office uh, for those situations. We um, also recommend, uh, and we can we can assist with this uh, notifying CDC, uh, the state CDC as well. Um, I, I think that's a good step. Um, uh, but we're always, um, uh, you know, ready to hear uh, patients' experiences, um, whether they're good or bad, um, and those are really important. That's really important information. If we are notified by a patient that they believe uh, they were sickened by um, a product from a store, um, we can obviously go in um, and investigate that store um, to see if uh, there is any there there um, and make recommendations to that store um, as, uh, with regard to better uh, handling and to give them an idea of what's going on. And it is important, um, you know, that a cantaloupe, you know, had the salmonella scare a uh, number of years ago, and, and there are things that get pulled off the market from different stores um, all the time. So it's important for people to speak out, not, you know, protect yourself first. Don't use it, con con uh, contact the place you bought it, but also speak out. So thank you, uh, Office of Cannabis Policy, for offering um, an easy way to do that. Important. Yeah, well, um, I would that, you know, that you know um when you hear about a recall it, it's it's not it doesn't mean that there's a a horrible company you know involved right recalls are part of a healthy regulatory system right and so what is scary about not having a regulatory framework uh for the medical cannabis um market in in Maine is that if a patient is experiencing um a problem you know there's no way for um uh, the office to pull those products off or even inform patients, hey, if you bought this product, you could be exposed to X, Y, and Z. Um, and so, you know, um, there's only so much individuals can do. And if you're, if you're dealing with a major healthcare issue, the last thing you want to think about is having to test and, you know, be your own advocate in that, in that arena. And I'm afraid, you know, until, until we see better regulations, that is, that's where patients are. Um, and so if the if those who are selling cannabis to patients um, you know, want to take that burden off patients, you can step up and, and test your products outside of a regulatory system. Um, my next question, uh, again, for both of you, one of the, uh, we'll say, arguments that I hear all the time when I'm advocating for um, testing, mandatory testing here in Maine, um, is something along the lines of, uh, you know, we don't test lettuce, we don't test Cheerios, why do we test cannabis? And so um, I'm curious, uh, both of your reactions, maybe start with you, Dr. Hymanson. Um, yeah, I, um, you know, you don't smoke lettuce. Um, you know, these are 
uh, sick people who are um, looking toward to a medication to help them with their symptoms. And they want to go in knowing that this will help them and not that there's something hidden in there that might harm them that they don't know about. And so um, the lettuce um, you eat, but also has a regulatory structure around it. Um, and that's why we know we know that, you know, um, uh, melon cantaloupe had salmonella in it. <clears throat> um, you also have an organic, um, you know, there are regulations around the organic um, growing of produce. And so um, uh, there are structures around lettuce. Um, and uh, for people who have, who want a med medicine, um, who are expecting, and, and people say, well, food is medicine. All food is medicine. Lettuce is medicine. Yeah, of course it is. And cannabis as a, as a plant is medicine. Absolutely. Um, however, people are taking this because they have a medical problem that they might get into trouble with um, if they're immunosuppressed or, or have other um, medicines on board. It's more complicated. So I think people expect if you're going to call it a medicine and that they um, are assured that there's nothing that's going to harm them. I would, I would say that is just a false statement. Lettuce and Cheerios are both tested. Um, uh, you hear about lettuce recalls all the time um, around E. coli. Um, I mean, it's that is just a completely false statement. So anything that is sold in the United States for human consumption is tested. Um, it you know the testing um, there are batch testing for uh, leafy vegetables. Um, there are on site um, inspections um, of all agricultural products. So. Um, that's just a false statement. And so I think that um, uh, where I find myself with this argument is that, you know, if you, um, you know, if you want to sell products in the United States in a, um, and, and uh, receive the benefits of being part of a licit market, um, then regulation is, you know, those are the rules that that's how, that's how you bring your product product to that market. If you are not in my mind, if you are not um, testing uh, those products, then you are playing by the rules of an illicit market. Um, and so, you know, those have consequences. So I think that, um, you know, it's time to stop sort of hiding behind this, the prohibition um, phase, which was very real, um, but our organization fought um, to stop the federal raids on, um, you know, facilities and for people who were providing medicines to patients. And I think what we were, you know, to sort of the, the contract, I think, between patient advocates and, um, and suppliers was that they would supply safe products to patients. And so um, you now, you know, don't have to worry about being arrested by the DEA or being prosecuted by the Department of Justice. And so those funds that you were giving to lawyers, um, why don't you put it in testing? That's what I would say. <laughs> I, I will also say that in Maine, we're very proud of our small growers of um, of uh, uh, produce and and um, and so we have a lot of roadside stands and people who um, count on their neighbors who grow these things. I have a farm stand right at the corner of my road, and I love their corn. And I know that that's not tested, but I'm but it's I count uh, we count on our neighbors to um, to make sure that we're not getting sick from it. And if we were, we'd have a ready person to go to. And I think the cannabis market here has grown up like that, small growers who are proud of their work and have done really good work um, and um, don't, you know, want to do the best thing for the people who they, they uh, come in contact with. Um, but the best thing for them would be to prove that, um, you know, trust but verify because um, this is really a medicine that people are counting on for something. In, and um, Kind of like a Venn diagram. Remember those? You know, you, <laughs> you want to make sure safety is in the middle there. So, and I think that's so important. I think that you know, it's also you know, if you're a, um, you know, if you are cultivating um, medical cannabis, you know, you also want to you know, be ensured that the whole supply chain is safe. You know, you could be, um, you know, testing your products, but if you're handing it over to a manufacturer or to a, um, or to a retail location. 
that isn't um, you know meeting product safety standards. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, contamination um, can happen at any at any part of the supply chain. All right, we've got about 15 minutes left. I'm gonna transition now toward um, some audience Q&A. Um, as a reminder to uh, individuals in the audience, please use the chat function or the Q&A function uh, to send in questions. Uh, we've gotten a lot of them so far, so I'm gonna try to uh, work our way through as many as we can. I'm also balancing multiple platforms where I'm getting questions coming in from, so, so please uh, be patient. Uh, the first one I wanna uh, jump on uh, in, uh, feel free for either of you to answer, but Dr. Hymanson, I think this one is probably a, a bit more directed toward you. Um, it comes in anonymously and it asks, do you think it makes sense for medical providers to have product liability insurance as a requirement for licensing, especially with the high rate of failures in the medical program? Oh, I think we're far away from that conversation right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of other conversations to have before we we have that, um, I don't I don't have a good handle on that. I I think what I would say is that we need a lot of conversations about this that haven't really happened, um, and that would be one of them. I would just add to that, John, is I think that you know when we were in a prohibition space, um, you know the cannabis supply chain referred to itself as an industry. Um, and the and the reason you know I believe that they had to call themselves as, as an industry is that in prohibition they were responsible for every component of the supply chain. But as we're moving cannabis into the mainstream and out of a prohibition space, um, you know cannabis is actually a commodity that belongs in you know other other regulated industries. Um, and so as we're moving cannabis into a healthcare infrastructure. Um, questions like that will be answered, right? Like then you know we'll we'll be moving in you know into that component. But I think part of the the challenge is stakeholders, you know, keeping um, you know medical cannabis from evolving um, because they 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 don't want to see it evolve into these other these other industries. Um, so I think you know the way that we talk about cannabis is is really important. Thank you for that. Um, the yeah, and next, I will, I will also say that, you know, again, the state of Maine, we have a huge land mass. We only have 1.3 million people. We're really a, a small town and um, and the conversations flow quite easily. And um, I've, I've been impressed through the legislature and my, my work at Health and Human Services with a lot of complex issues at how willing people are to come together and have these important and difficult conversations but stay in the same room. The next two questions I have are, are from separate individuals, but they are related. And so um, uh, I'd love to hear um, either or both of your reactions. The first question comes from Ryan Parker, who asks, are all yeasts and molds considered dangerous? Are there any that are considered benign? And then the second question from Virginia Olson asks, can you process the mold out of a cannabis product? Do you, want to, do you want to take that, Doctor, or do you would like me? Yeah, to? I'll I'll take the um the um mold. You know, molds are everywhere. You know, they're you open your refrigerator and there they are in the back of your refrigerator on the piece of whatever that you had three days ago. So you know, they're every place. Um, but there are some that are toxic and some that are not, and there are some individuals who can stand um the toxic ones and the body reacts to it and gets rid of it, and there are others who are immunocompromised from cancer prednisone, other drugs that they're on who, who can't and it and they grow in the body. So um, um, so yeah, there are benign ones and there are toxic ones. Um, we mentioned as, aspir aspirogelosis, which is a tox can be a toxic one and really harmful. Um, so that's the medical answer. Yeah, I would say, and, and the regulatory answer is that is that there are, you know, the FDA um, and CDC have created um, actually levels that um, are harmful or not, right? Be you know, as, as Dr. Hyman mentioned, these um, microbes are everywhere. <laughs> They're floating through the air all the time, but there are levels that have been determined that are safe for human consumption. And as far as getting them out of, um, um, of products, this is, this is a little bit of a controversial topic. You know, in, in Europe, um, they use um, uh, a form of, of radiation before products go into pharmacies, um, sort of like they do with apples, and we, we use it in produce here in the United States. 
sort of like a, a low level radiation, like the level of an x-ray machine that does kill a lot of those substances. Um, people have argued that it also kills cannabinoids, um, but what we've seen in the European markets is it, it does not. Um, it may have some impact on terpenes, um, but I think there is this misnomer that if, if you buy, if you have a contaminated crop, that you can just pass that along to the manufacturers and they will pull those out. And I just wanna be clear that when you're making an extract, when you're making a concentrate, you are concentrating what is in the product. So you are not getting rid of mold or mildew, you are actually concentrating the contaminants. Um, so, um, you know, a um, in any other regulated market, when there are contaminate, contaminants found in the supply chain, those can, that product is destroyed. Um, it's not um, handed off to manufacturers and it's definitely not um, added to um, compassion programs for patients. Um, which I'm seeing in a lot of states that once things fail, people give them away to patients, which is horrible. <laughs> that is not compassionate. <laughs> so we have a couple I'll, of- I'll oh, also sorry, say, Can I also say that um, when you combust um, a mold, um, you can just, you'll destroy it potentially, but not always. And also the, the act of handling it may be the way, the route that it gets into your body um, because the mold spores come out when you handle the product. And that may be the thing that you inhale. Whereas maybe when you combust it, it destroys the mold. Um, but that's really unclear. You know, that's another thing. We, we really haven't investigated all of this stuff because it's an illegal substance federally. There hasn't been any money put into it. So, um, you know, combusting a pesticide and smoking that we sort of know a little bit about that, but not a lot. I, I was looking at that evidence and, um, you know, the end of all of the papers about what happens when you combust a, a pesticide and is it is it um, is it poisonous? At the end is like, we don't really know because we don't have the money or no one's done the research. But in the end, it says, you know, it can't be good for you. So We've had a few uh, related questions come in. And so I want to try to package them together as much as possible. And um, I'll say they, they sort of fall under the category of um, some skepticism about the levels of contaminants, the acceptable levels of contaminants in products. Um, someone noted that, you know, you can find traces of arsenic in coffee that you're brewing. Um, uh, another person asked um, why we pick certain levels um, for the threshold at which something passes or fails, specifically around mold. Um, I'll say in answer to that um, question, uh, the Office of Cannabis Policy um, works really closely with Maine CDC um, and the um, uh, experts there uh, to make sure that our testing program in adult use is um, rigorous, but also that it is reflecting the types of risks uh, that can uh, come to harm an individual. Uh, I know, Steph, you've done a lot of work on this um, safety standards and thresholds, et cetera, for a lot of contaminants and put out guides for other states. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that process goes? I know you've also worked uh, with a lot of doctors and scientists on, on this issue specifically. Yeah, um, I think that, um, so within the skepticism, I would just say, if you're skeptical about what were the tools that we have in front of us, um, then I would suggest investing in studies to show that there is a different level that is safe, right? So. The, um, what we're using at the regulatory level um, at, the, at the states um, does go through a political process where we do have um, you know, uh, cannabis businesses lobbying for lower, um, you know, lower levels at times, um, but you know, we're basically pulling what we know from you know, these substances in other products. So we're, we're relying on um, FDA, we're relying on CDC, um, but we're also, you know, um, Americans for Safe Access um, worked with the American Herbal Pharmacopeia um, to create a monograph um, where we pulled from international sources to come up with those, those levels. Um, you know, regulations are are not a are not set in stone; they're constantly evolving. And so, I would say, if if um, if someone, you know, and I think the cannabis businesses, if they want to see what other um, cannabis, you know, other businesses have done um, that are facing regulations. If you don't like what what is in front of us, what we know about product safety, um, then there's actually a process that you can you know, work with the university and actually do the testing and see if 
if there is another, um, you know, if there is another threshold. Um, but right now, um, these are the, this is what we know from health agencies is safe. Um, and, you know, arsenic, um, my favorite thing is I, you know, I don't put, you know, a little dash of arsenic on anything. Um, and I think in Maine, it sounds like you guys really have to um, look at this. And yes, there, you know, if you go onto the FDA um, site to look at contaminants, it'll actually gross you out um, to know that the levels of accepted contaminants as far as fecal matter, everything, like there is a level that is allowed. Um, but um, but I think that, you know, again, as Dr. Herman continues to point out, like we're talking about a medicine as well. Um, and so there is a, you know, a higher level um, that's needed. And we're also regulating a space that's, that's unknown. So until, until research is specifically done on cannabis and how it is consumed, these are the, these are the, the numbers that we have. Yeah. And I'll mention, you know, rice is a, is a phytoremediator. And there are um, t our arsenic um, levels in rice. Um, brown rice is worse than white rice. If you um, if you wash white rice, you get some of the arsenic out. But you know, people who use rice a lot are concerned about this. Um, there's all sorts of talk on whatever about uh, arsenic in rice. Um, so there's that. But um, this is a medicine, and people want to know. And so if they know that there's some arsenic in it, they might choose to say, okay, well, you've told me, um, you know, that maybe it's okay. It doesn't it's just a little low dose or, you know, they're, you're not using it a lot and maybe it's, it's all right. And you can choose as a consumer to say, okay. But I think the person has to know that there's some arsenic in what they're using. And, um, and then they can choose to say yes to you or choose to go somewhere else where there isn't one. But um, that should should be a consumer driven decision. No, I, and I I love that. I think that you know what is um you know um when you're looking at someone who's using rice, you know they're maybe eating rice a couple times a week, but you know and the same thing even with the adult use market, someone may just be using a little cannabis, um you know on the weekends or whatever. But patients are using are generally using cannabis the same way they would use other medications. So um you know two to four times a day. Um, you know, they're, they're consuming these. So um, I would say, you know, if the, if the market in um, Maine doesn't want um, to have testing regulations, I feel like the, the very least is they should put labels that says this has not been tested um, so that the patients are aware. And, you know, as the doctor said, like, you know, just let, you know, patients should be allowed um, and all consumers should be allowed to make that decision um, and it shouldn't be made for them. One of the questions that um, has come in, again, my apologies, I'm balancing multiple devices to get to all of these, um, uh, asked about the cost of testing um, and uh, the concerns about it uh, making medicine too expensive uh, for patients. Um, I will say um, we have some evidence about this from our adult use program. Uh, the adult use program in Maine uh, instituted mandatory testing and then subsequently instituted uh, mandatory pesticide testing. Um, during those waves of, of testing requirements, um, the price per gram of cannabis in Maine has continued to decline. Um, and there were concerns initially that this would drive up the cost of cannabis and it really empower the illicit market. What we found is that has not been the case um, in the adult use market. Um, I will say that um, if a business model is one um, in which producing clean cannabis is too costly, um, there's something wrong with the business model. Um, at the Office of Cannabis Policy, we're, we're not going to focus on profits at the expense of patients' health. Um, and our experience from the adult use market, uh, and Steph, you can speak to this in other states, um, you monitor um, prices and access in other states. Um, testing requirements others, in other states, uh, medical programs has not made cannabis too expensive for the consumer. Yeah, first, I, I will say I've never heard a patient make that argument. Um, uh, and and it's also, it's just not true. That's not what we're seeing in, in markets. And I think in Maine, uh, and John, thanks for bringing that up. Um, there's a taste, there's a test case right there, right? Like the adult use market is tested and the price has dropped. So it's a non-conversation. It's a non-starter. Um, it is, you know, um, it, I can see maybe people were fearful of that before, but it's just not true. Um, and if someone has to pay a little less on um, on marketing 
um, and a little more for testing. Um, I think <laughs> I think that that is appropriate. Um, and you know, again, going back to consumers, you know, you have power. So if you if you are only you know purchasing cannabis that um, where there are certificates of analysis available, um, then you know, in order to stay in business, uh, other businesses will follow. So you know, yes, the legislature should step in, um, but you also have you know the power to make make that decision. I think you know, everybody who is watching this lets um, other patients know that their products are not tested. Um, you know, then then that's the beginning of power. Knowledge is power. A couple of other questions came in, and um, I, I can sort of rapid fire answer them uh, briefly. One asked if Maine has lab standards um, so that t uh, tests are um, prepared and, and designed the same. Um, yes, uh, we we certify. We ha now have four certified cannabis testing labs in the state. Uh, the testing labs are certified by Maine CDC um, according to the standards uh, that they use, and so those are um, those are in place. Um, uh, another uh, question came in asking. Uh, why the new proposed medical rules um, do not include mandatory testing. Um, that question was, uh, came in from Mike Everett. Uh, Mike, we've we have faced, um, prior to my arrival here and since, um, profound resistance um, from within the legislature um, on this issue and from some uh, medical cannabis groups uh, in the state um, about this issue. It is something I'm passionate about. Um, uh, when uh, we uh, take steps towards uh, uh, implementing these types of policies. I want to make sure that we're doing it right, that it's fully informed, that as Steph noted earlier, that you have a, a true regulatory apparatus that can do all of the things that it needs to do to protect patients' health uh, and to protect the integrity of the medicine. Um, and so I'll say stay tuned um, on that in the future. The last question I want to pitch to uh, you, Steph, um, it comes it's specifically um, uh, to you and it's from a reporter. Um, who asks, uh, does ASA know how many states with medical programs require testing? And feel free to plug uh, your website and resources in the process. Yes, I would say um, uh, we just issued a report um, uh, this July called Regulating Patient Health um, that you can download at safeaccessnow.org slash what's in your cannabis. Um, and we, it actually breaks down what every state is testing for. Um, you know, most states have some type of testing. Um, um, DC, you know, has, has mandatory testing, but they have failed to, op to open a lab. Um, and, and Maine is one of the, the few places, um, where there's no testing for medical. Um, but, um, we also put out a report every year called the state of the states, um, which you can find at safeaccessnow.org slash SOS, um, where we actually grade all of all of the states um, and and their regulations. But um, uh, but thanks for that question. And I just you know as we're as we're ending, I just want patients to know that you know, you have power. Um, this you know I know the last thing you want to think about when you're sick is is advocating for yourself in one more arena. Um, but you know um, you know, inform you know, stay informed, inform others and use the power of the dollar um, and use the power of the vote. Excellent. Well, Steph Shearer, Dr. Patty Hymanson, thank you so much for uh, joining us for this conversation today, a really critical one uh, for our state. Um, our staff has been dropping links in uh, to the chat function, um, uh, particularly as Steph has been mentioning, uh, some, of those, uh, the, some of those resources, including the What's in Your Cannabis report and the ASA State of the State report um, just got dropped in. Um, stay tuned uh, from Office of Cannabis Policy on our forthcoming report on contaminants uh, in the, the medical cannabis supply chain. Um, the slides that we used uh, for today's presentation, in addition, uh, additional slides rather um, that Steph put together will be made available on our website. Um, uh, and other than that, thank you all for joining me. Uh, thank you to our panelists and we'll see you at the next cannabis conversation. Bye everyone. Thanks, John. Thanks, Patty. Thank you so much. Thank you.